Good afternoon. Um, I'm going to introduce this session now, which is on current <coughs> practice. We're very fortunate to have more eight practitioners with us. We have Alice Ross, who's a journalist with the Bureau of Investigative Journalism, and Amanda Weston, who's a barrister with Garden Court Chambers. Garden Court Chambers being <coughs> well represented today, I should say. Um, so I'm going to um, introduce this. Which one of you would like to go first? I'm going first. Um, okay. So Amanda's going to go first. Um, Amanda's a barrister at Garden Court Chambers, as I said. She has established practice in public and administrative law with an emphasis on civil liberties and vulnerable client groups. She's been instructed in many of the leading cases. And um, most notably, um, she's also worked on the successful Abu Hamza appeal. And she's uh, been recently working on TPIM control order cases and has appeared with Stephanie Harrison, QC, in the leading authority on Nyawa on the Home Secretary's powers to certify and therefore terminate judicial review under the Justice and Security Act 2013. She's also appeared on television and radio speaking about <coughs> the development of these powers. And we're very fortunate to have her with us. And, uh, she'll speak for about half an hour, and then we'll turn over to Alice. Thank you. Jeez, thanks for that. Um, oh, you all, I understand, had quite a thorough grounding in the uh, legal frameworks. So I'm not going to be troubling you with that. I've been scrutiny on my hand. I've not, not told you what section of what act I'm talking about, but you probably all know by now. I, um, I will admit that that um, PowerPoint was um, prepared in a bit of a hurry yesterday. Um, now, how do I go to the next frame? Oh, you should just be able to right click on the mouse. If I right click on the mouse, okay. Okay, there we go. Okay. I never thought I'd be opening a speech of mine with a quote from Jeff Bezos. Thanks to Diane Abbott for spotting that. Um, uh, right, so I'm going to talk about, about procedure, what actually happens uh, on the ground. And um, I will admit to um, uh, this being a field of law where we're really making it up as we go along. Um, and that's because the kinds of decisions that are being made are unprecedented. Effectively, and I'm going to come to it in a bit more detail, but we have now a situation, and I think you probably had it flagged up to this morning, we have what, what now amounts to... Uh, Sorry, Exxon. So you can be deprived of your citizenship, uh, and that takes effect before a court can scrutinise its law. So what you should have from me is this sort of um, panel. But you should also have two extracts of hand which I'm going to hopefully take you to in a bit more detail. Because there's a key question. I'm probably taking this out of order. I can't remember what order the frame is. But um, there's a key question arising. Um, from all this stuff, um, and, and the question is this, when did Parliament sanction summary exile? When did Parliament agree that that was a, 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 a course which the law should take? And after, I'm going to try and answer that question uh, after taking <coughs> I right click, then nothing happens. It's a curse of Western. I right tap, and nothing happens again. Okay, here we go. Right. Now, you've looked at that a bit this morning, haven't you? You've been sorry. And the important thing to remember is that um, it's not just um, people who have become British, um, it's also people who were all British and have never known any other. Situation. Now, that's not to draw a distinction between two classes of British citizens, because uh, that would be wrong for the reasons that Jacob Rees so eloquently said in his credit. But the law does, in a sense, make such a distinction, and I will um, uh, come on to that shortly. So, um, you'll be familiar with, I don't know if you've seen the free movement blog, Colin Yeo's free movement blog, but you might have seen his um, uh, extract of the Judge Dredd cartoon, where Judge Dredd goes, citizenship is a privilege, not a right. And so <laughs> he, he was able to submit that government's getting there, or she's at least getting her, her policies from, from Judge Dredd now, which is 
fun. <laughs> and, um, so uh, the real question is, how does that sit with the, the, the concept of somebody who has either been born British as a right, that is to say, not as a consequence of the largesse of any politician, but secondly, um, how does that square with the lawful obtaining of citizenship as a consequence of a, of a, uh, a procedure which is laid down by statute? Um, admittedly, when it comes to naturalisation and registration, the Secretary of State does retain a discretion, but that is not as a politician or as a distributor of large X, but as a Minister of State. So, um, the threshold for deprivation you've looked at this morning, it's, it's wide and open to interpretation. Are you nodding? You have looked at um, the duty. That's good. So you're familiar that... Everyone's nodding, that's good. Nodding's really good, because otherwise I'll just repeat myself. And that's good. <laughs> okay, so um, conducive to the public good, um, very wide. In the context of deportation, you'll be familiar with it. It's elastic um, as a concept. Are you familiar with David Blunkett's unacceptable behaviours? Right. I'm going to be coming into those shortly. Right, so what's the procedure? You've looked at the law a bit this morning. And um, without going too much into the statutory framework that we've already been through this morning, it goes like this. So you start with your in principle decision by the Secretary of State. So what will happen is that officers, usually of the Home Office, but increasingly of the Foreign and Commonwealth Office, and the reason I know that is because in a case called L1, when we <coughs> apply for um, disclosure under the Data Protection Act of uh, material held by the Foreign Commonwealth Office in respect of the deprivation of citizenship of L1, um, when, we, when we finally got disclosure, it was quite clear that it was the Foreign Commonwealth Office driving that decision. All right, so um, then the submission will be made to the Secretary of State. Um, and the Secretary of State will either approve or, um, or not the um, principal decision. Uh, there then is a question around um, the service of the notice of intention to deprive. Now you'll have heard, presumably this morning, not if you can, about the initial decision being the service of the notice of intention to deprive under Section 40 of the British Nationality Act. That has to be served in writing. Are you allowed to like answer questions or ask questions on the way? Because I'm really I'm happy with that. And some of you have got like questioning faces. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I mean, if that's okay, then I'm I'm, I'm happy for people to ask questions on the way. If anything isn't clear. All right. So um, so you've got your service, your, your notice of intention to deprive, and there are um, regulations, the British nationality regulations, which provide that that has to be in writing. Um, the statutory framework also. Uh, Provides there have to be reasons, which is quite interesting because most of the English people don't get any reasons. And there's an issue around, although it hasn't really been litigated yet, and I get laughed at every time I, I say, hang on a minute, there's, there's this issue here, and um, things sort of take on a momentum of their own. Um, but there's an issue around the extent to which notice can be compared <coughs> with the regulatory framework um, if there's any reason. And it's, it could be deemed valid notice. So there's an issue around that. So, but the, the reasons, because of what we're dealing with here, I'm, I'm not dealing with, and we're not dealing really today with the broad situation, we're dealing with the national security questions. And so, um, most um, decisions will be gnomic um, in their scope uh, and uh, leave a lot of um, questions um, raised on the basis of, of which the, the, the deprivation decision has been taken. Some people get no reason. Um, it is necessary if the Secretary of State wants to um, uh, wants to give rise to appeal an appeal which is in um, SIAC. We're all, all clear about the difference between the tribunal and SIAC. So SIAC is, is, is where the um, appeals occur, where the Secretary of State wants to rely on closed material effectively. And if there is no closed material, um, then the um, matter would normally proceed in the tribunal. So what effectively happens is you get most of the fraud cases happening in the tribunal and the national security cases happening uh, in, um, in SIAC. So you're served with this notice of intention to deprive and the notice of appeal rights. Now, um, 
for the reasons I'm about to come on and explain, the Secretary of State used to have to delay signing any declaration order until the lawfulness of the decision to the crime had been determined by a court where an appeal right was exercised. The provision of law which prevented uh, the Secretary of State doing, doing that was section 40 bracket 6 which was repealed. And I'm going to come in a bit more detail to explain how that got repealed, what the supposed purpose was and what the reality was. So there we have um, the, 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 the signing of the declaration order and then the serving of the declaration order and then possibly an exclusion decision. Now in the early days the Secretary of State was very fond of serving an exclusion decision at the same time as the um, uh, declaration. The Secretary of State worked out they didn't really have to do that because it's right, isn't it, that once you're no longer British, you would have to apply the Secretary of State for some, in some capacity to return. And you have to have documents to do that. Um, and also that um, uh, you would have to apply in some capacity and the Secretary of State has got wide, once it's a question of the Secretary of State's discretion to let you in or not, the rules apply, as we're aware, under immigration law, the Secretary of State has a wide discretion to exclude you if you make an application. So why exclude in advance? You're just, you're just um, inviting someone to judicially review your exclusion. So they've stopped doing that. They, I think, are making it up as they go along, rather in the same way that we are. You do really get a sense, actually, on the ground, that there's a sense of flags being run up flag cons and people seeing what they can get away with. And the Secretary of State, I think, so far is pretty amazed at how easy it is. Right, so, um, of course, except in the case, technical case of Mr. Argeda, in which case it hasn't been very easy at all, I think Mr. Berry's going to talk to you about that. Right, so, um, uh, the practice or the policy in deprivation cases, this is, a, a, is an extract from an FOI response, which uh, was a re re replied to Diane Taylor of The Guardian, making an application back in um, 2010. <coughs> um, it's quite interesting, isn't it? Um, 2007, 2008, 2009, uh, everyone, so only, only three deprivations and uh, only one of those wasn't outside the UK. And then we've got a change of government for five deprivations. All outside the UK. Um, now, I'm going to talk a little bit about L1. Um, L1 um, was uh, an individual who was um, married and had two, now three British citizen children residing in the UK. He, he had been naturalised um, back in about in the early 2000s. And um, he, he was a refugee. He'd actually been detained in Sudan prior to um, coming to the UK and indeed had variously been detained by the Sudanese authorities in trips back to Sudan. But notwithstanding that, he travelled back to Sudan um, on holiday with his children during the school holidays with an intention to return in September at the beginning of the school term. What we, what we discovered from the disclosure that we obtained in L1 um, from the FCO was that the decision to deprive L1 of citizenship was actually taken back in 2009. Um, the FCO documents from the embassy and um, some coming from TESOL um, made it clear that um, at some stage they realised in 2009 it was about to get on the plane back to the UK at which somebody shouted abort, abort and nothing happened um, and, and for some 10 months or so until the next summer came and he left again. So, that means that L1 was at large, no control order, not in Barmarsh, not subject to any um, counter-terror measures that we're aware of, probably surveillance, but um, that doesn't um, necessarily counteract a risk to national security if one exists, of course. Um, so then he leaves on holiday with his, with his children, and then immediately um, the decision is served on his home address. 
um, in London and what he's not there, so he doesn't know anything about it. Um, and then the order is signed straight away, to the effect he's never British. So anyway, at some point in September, he pitched up at the embassy in Khartoum to sort out, I think it was his wife's um, uh, documents. For whatever reason, he went there. Um, and at that point, he was told, we're not going to help you to your passion of British and hand over your passport. And he was rather shocked to hear that. <coughs> Um, L1 uh, is somebody who has a, uh, a life-threatening brain condition um, and he's had sort of quite complex and um, uh, pioneering surgery and it involves him having checkups with a specialist in Switzerland which the NHS was, uh, was providing him with and um, he, he's someone who suffers from seizures and he's not in the best of health. The reason I had a lot of detail was that was from, about that was not from L1. It was from the FCO disclosure weighing up the pros and cons of where they were going to deprive him. And one of their concerns was that he would have an Article 3 case if they deprived him while he was in the UK. And one of the concerns was that he might die if they deprived him enough that he was out of the country. That's to say that his condition may be terminated. So we wouldn't really have known about that unless we got the FCO disclosure because not a word of that came out in the SIAC proceedings. We didn't have a clue about that. What um, the Secretary of State decided to do was to procedurally head off the appeal rather than engage in the substance of the appeal. And that is very much um, a preferred way forward for the Secretary of State in defending these decisions. They will, if, they will normally try to best your own procedure rather than actually get into the merits of the deprivation. And um, one of the ways, of course, they um, best your own procedure is by making it difficult for you to conduct your appeal. And one of the ways they do that is by ensuring that you're out of the country and the decision is taken. Now, before I get into the um, substance of how the courts have dealt with that uh, ways around it, I'd just like to talk to you a little bit about the circumstances in which the suspensive right to appeal can be used. Because it's problematic. Um, so section 40A6, which I already referred to, provided that an order under section 40 may not be made in respect of a person who has an appeal under this section, or section 2B of the Special Immigration Appeals Commission Act, the section that gives you an appeal right to the commission, has been instituted and has not yet been finally determined what or abandoned or could be brought, ignoring any possibility of the PRs or time provision. So Parliament considered and enacted 1406 effectively that the decision that the deprivation order shouldn't have effect unless or until a court had ruled on its lawfulness. If you're familiar with the immigration framework, you will know that Parliament has been fairly specific about the circumstances in which you do and do not have a right to appeal, and very specific about the circumstances in which you do and do not have an in-country right to appeal. Interestingly, the, um, pro the provisions and the um, catalogue of, of, of amendments over a short period of time have not resulted in Parliament being clear, or being, an given, being given an opportunity to be clear about the circumstances in which deprivation of citizenship appeals should be conducted in or out of the UK. The whole framework is silent. So subsection 40A6 was repealed by the well-known Asylum and Immigration Treatment of Claimants Act, which is mostly famous for um, trying to circumscribe the discretion of a judge to decide whether someone's family truth or not. But there were some other provisions which snuck through late on in the passage of the bill. Why was subsection 40A6 repealed? It's pretty dramatic in its effect. Why, why was it appealed and what discussion was held about that? This is what Lord Brooker said. Um, and when proposing the amendment, um, which uh, would have 
that effect, although it's a slightly complicated history, and when I show you the detail of Hansel, you'll understand what I mean. Um, so it's clear that the justification given for the removal of the provision was this stated intention of the government to run deprivation appeals on citizenship and deportation together. That says, in-country appeals. We don't want, and it makes sense, doesn't it? It's quite, it's quite sensible. I don't think anybody here in this room would disagree. But if you're going to have um, a right of appeal, and you've got a one-stop type framework, it's, it seems um, otios to have an appeal, successive appeals, giving exactly the same subject matter. We might not agree with that it's in the best interest of our clients, but looking at the, the framework of the law, it's not an objectionable approach in itself. That's how it was presented to Parliament. Can I ask you to take a look at the, um, the extract in hands of the I haven't highlighted my copy, unfortunately, so I'm going to have to take a look at the final bit of the But at your leisure, you might want to spend a bit of time reading through the whole of what we said. Before I do, I just wanted to take you, if I can, to the explanatory <coughs> notes to the um, 2004 Act. <coughs> Paragraph 121 says this. This is referring to the um, paragraph of the Schedule 2 repealing the suspensive right of appeal. This provision has the effect that appeals under this Act are handled in the same way as appeals under Part 5 of the 2002 Act, i.e. the ones that And the same provisions for higher court oversight and legal aid are applied. The same provisions for higher court oversight and legal aid are applied. It also has the effect that a deprivation order can be made before any appeal is heard, thereby allowing deprivation and deportation proceedings to take place. <coughs> so that was in the explanatory notes. Let's have a look at what Lord Rooker said on the 15th of June, which is the second extract. Now he's referring to Amendment number 52, which was made in committee. The reason the amendment proposed um, uh, in this part of the week was a curious one in, in, the, in the scheme of things. It was provided for a remedy in SIAC or in the tribunal. You're aware that Section 87 of the 2002 Act provides a power for the tribunal or the commission to make a direction in a successful appeal. I'm familiar with that, so sometimes if you're representing an individual, you might say, in your skirt and argument, and furthermore, we seek a, um, a direction under Section 87 to give effect to the appeal. So it might be, or well, it's unlikely to be, but it could be a direction to, to issue entry clearance or to issue a certain form of leave to take that measures. Um, Courts in general aren't keen on them, but the power's there. And so the amendment to Section 87 said this, that, that a direction in those terms, or a direction in those consequences, may, um, may, may, uh, may include an order under Section 40 above to be treated as having had no effect. Now, you can understand that in the context of an income appeal, can't you? You could understand an order of that kind, a sort of a retrospective order, having meaning in the context of somebody who hadn't already been required to leave the UK. What about somebody who had and been ex excluded from returning? What possible effect or meaning could that remedy have for a person who'd already been subject to a deprivation order? Leaving that aside, go on to how Lord Rooker explained the necessity for that amendment. It's necessary because of an amendment that was made in committee the effect of that earlier amendment is that the fact that an appeal against a decision to make a the deprivation of citizenship under section 40, blah, 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 does not prevent an order for deprivation being made. The deprivation order might then be followed more or less immediately by commencement of deportation action, or by certification of detention. No reference to out-of-country matters. Now this is the curious part. Although the earlier amendment was actually unintentional, Having reviewed the position, we believe that it would make considerable sense 
to be able to run the appeals, <coughs> the deprivation appeal on citizenship, and the deportation and or certification appeal together. We therefore propose to amend the relevant uh, appeal procedures, blah, 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 subject to the approval of Parliament, we all know how meaningful that is, to require an appeal against citizenship deprivation and any appeal against deportation or against certification under the 2001 Act to be heard together. So what's he saying? He's saying, well, we actually... It was a funny little glitch and it was completely accidental, but you know what? It's going to be really good because we're going to do this now. And by the way, we're going to be able to deprive people of their citizenship by waiting till they leave the country and then serve them when they're outside the country and prevent them from coming back. There was not, no mention of that. So, no mention of the effect of summary exile. So, there's, in no sense was Parliament at that stage aware that one of the potential and indeed possibly I hesitate to say this because there's no evidence of it. I mean, I, I, I'd be astounded if the, if the, if the course of the deprivation was taken was, was accidental. Somebody said, oh, look, we can do this. I don't, I, don't, I, just, I, don't, I don't sign up to that. I think they always knew what the, um, what the impact was going to be. So it talks about the benefit of the uh, remedy being to, for instance, safeguard the interests of a child who was born during the intervening period. But there's no reference to um, how it would be possible with a remedy like that to cure the injustice of somebody being deprived of their citizenship while they were <clears throat> outside the country, and then all the consequences that flow from that, for instance, being separated from your home, work, family, livelihood, possibly you're in a country where you're at risk, possibly you're in a place where you've got no, no right to stay, the consequences which flow from it with, with respect are unlikely to be able to be cured by a remedy such as that. That wasn't flagged up to point at the time. And that came back in July on the front page. Now there's a reference in there to um, <coughs> the need to extend those provisions to um, appeals of paternity and science and science which is another sort of technical minor amendment. And this is how it was described. It talks about the, the remedy, the first paragraph. It talks about how it needs to be applicable in the context of appeals to Sarah. And he says this, this might be thought to be a minor technical amendment, and I suspect that it probably is. But it ensures the bill gives full effect to the policy on joining deprivation appeals and appeals against deportation action and or certification, as the case may be, under the Anti-Terrorism Crime Security Act. It's the only passage I remember. The message was, the measure was described in detail at recommittal, was it? <coughs> and your lordship supported it, because your lordships didn't really know what the objective of it was. I believe that the noble lord, Lord McNally, said at the time it was sensible and overdue provisions that should be supported. It goes on in the same vein, but the particular part that I wanted to draw your attention to was at the bottom of the part of the section. It does not limit the grounds for appeal against deprivation of citizenship and key, or take away appeal rights in those cases where I beg to differ. I think it did take an important appeal right away, and that was the right to access a court prior to the decision uh, being effective. So, when, against that background, um, when we are looking at what we're pleased to call parliamentary uh, provisions, parliament, parliament sanctioned provisions, statutory provisions, legislative provisions, with the, with the sovereignty of parliament behind them. We, we, we really do need to look in a bit more detail about what Parliament actually decided. What's wrong with an out-of-country appeal? Um, this is my favourite quote on how rubbish out-of-country appeals are. Um, Secretary of State says they don't have a policy of waiting until people have left the country before they make these decisions. I was just going to come on and explain to you in a bit more detail about the numbers of cases in which 
undeniably, having looked at the numbers of cases in which that approach has been taken, it's again rather difficult for the Secretary of State to defend that position. What about an out-of-country SIAC appeal? Well, we know that SIAC is already a departure from the normal standards of fairness because the appellant doesn't get to see the evidence against him, can't effectively rebut, especially in the context of deportation. There's some movement afoot on just sort of by the by on the extent to which um, there should be disclosure inside procedures in the context of deportation proceedings. You're all familiar with Article 6 and Mario and how it's applied to deportation proceedings, which is a, a public law area. Um, and then there's a question that arises about whether the procedural obligations are inherent in Article 8 nevertheless imply uh, minimum standards of fairness, <coughs> including core minimum standards of disclosure, in order for any remedy against an Article 8 breach would be um, effective, taken with Article 8. Oh, sorry, taken with Article 13. So, um, one of the problems then, in normal circumstances inside, well, that's what Lord Justice, Lord Justice Sullivan said in E1. E1 was a case where the Secretary of State had served Mr E1 with the document saying you only have an out of country right of appeal, and that was wrong. And that was wrong because of a case called MK Tunisia, which decided that there was an in country right of appeal where you um, cut down someone's indefinite which remained and you're outside the country at the time. So you've got a 10 day window to get back to exercise your in country right of appeal. I will intervene there and say curtailed it thanks to Amanda's genius and I'll do it. Just it didn't happen by accident. She pulled that decision out of the jaws of everything. Okay, read that. <laughs> read that. Anyway, so um uh, right. So um thanks for that. Um yeah, so um Mr E one was so with this document saying um you don't have a right to appeal. Um and then his representatives um uh, when uh, MK came out, um, put in a uh, launch of judicial review saying, well, you're going to have to reissue the decision and start again so that you can come back and exercise the right of appeal. Um, uh, and Mr. Justice Whitting said, said, no, we're fine. There's nothing wrong with in country right, out of country right of appeal. It's all fine. We can handle this. I can look at you on the video and think I'd like the cut of the gym or not, and it will all be fine. <laughs> I paraphrase. Um, Chatham House rules. <laughs> but um, yeah, so um, uh, this is what Lord Justice Southern said. Um, uh, I, I won't read it out until it, it's there. I mean, it's, it's just a fabulous reminder. Um, SIAC is a nightmare to, to prepare and present cases in. A appellants, the fiction that the Secretary of State bends over backwards to ameliorate the unfairness. It's just a joke. I've just had a morning of it where the Secretary of State says they don't have to conduct what's called... Do you know um, about the various measures that are in place to try and make SIAC a little bit fairer? So you've got an exculpatory review which the Secretary of State has to go away in the view of the material you've given her and have a look for any evidence that she has um, that can um, help your case. And then the second thing is something called the Rule 38 procedure where the court looks carefully um, for the assistance of the special advocate and what additional information ought to be disclosed because there's no proper justification for people to have it. So a balancing exercise, but in any event, if the Secretary of State is unable to persuade the court that there's a real national security reason why you shouldn't have the document, then you get it. You don't get much. But yeah, so that's what's supposed to happen. In, 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 in K2's case, K2's deprivation case, K2 is saying, uh, I can't communicate with my lawyers because I'm frightened. I'm in a country where there's surveillance. I'm in a country where, which has a really bad human rights record, except by the Secretary of State. I'm, I'm in a case where if I engage with a national security case in this appeal, I'm at risk. You will put me at Article 3 risk if you require me to communicate with you about the substance of the national security allegations against me. I've got a positive case I want to put. Like, say, for instance, and this isn't K2's case, but let's say, for instance, that the allegation is that you know X, and X is an Al Qaeda captain, right? So you might want to be able to say, well, actually, yeah, I know him, and I know him, 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 and him, and this is all I know, but the fact is that I know him because my wife knows so and so, and she's related to so and so, and we've had holidays in their place and traveled back, and I've never been involved in anything, but I do know all these people. But, but it's, there's a benign explanation for it, you might want to do that. 
Do you want to be talking about those people on a phone link from a country with surveillance? Actually, that's a kind of a weird question because is there a country with surveillance? But anyway, <laughs> just that, that, that's an issue. That, that's an issue. You might not feel secure. Your own police in the country in which you're, where you're staying, may be on the side of the people that you fear. You, I mean, there, or there are myriad contexts in which these these issues can arise in myriad countries. It's very, very difficult to run your... Uh, and, and just leaving aside what about the, the, the difficulty that um, uh, SIAC information comes through in a drip feed way, you get a bit here, a bit there, you're constantly pestering them to tell you something that's going to be of any use to you. And how many times are you supposed to go back to your client? So, okay, so they can go and conduct their appeal from a, from a, from a third country. They can, they, how are they going to get there? They haven't got a passport anymore. You know what, it's just, honestly, it's endless. All this has to be evidence, because otherwise, the Secretary of State comes along and says, well, this is the third time they've asked for an extension and they still haven't put in a witness statement. And there's, and there's the answer, well, what am I supposed to say in a witness statement? You know, I, I can't communicate. I can't do it safely. I'm frightened. Maybe my fears are unfounded, but they're my fears. You won't guarantee my safety. How can I engage in this case? Um, that's a summary. I'm sure that there are people that try and play the procedure. I haven't met any yet. I've just gone through all this stuff. Have I run over my time? Coming pretty close. But... <laughs> okay, right. So, um, that's just, you know, it's a summary. It's anybody who knows how appallingly difficult it is to run a case at all will understand what you're up against the additional overlay of trying to conduct it from a foreign country. What do we do about that? What does the court say about the law for this court? Well, G one's an interesting case because um, I don't think, I mean, I'll be as honest as I can. I, I've been learning on the job and um, I think when I first started doing these sorts of cases, I was living in some kind of Winnie the Pooh park where people were basically decent and it was all fair and um, nobody really wanted to be harmful to my kind of tell lives. My real wake up call was the Abu Hamza case where the expert, the government's expert in Abu Hamza had, um, now Abu Hamza of course didn't have the benefit of the suspense fight in the US, let's not forget. But imagine if he'd had to go somewhere else or... I mean, how would he have coped, anyway? Leaving that aside. Um, in the Abu Hamza case, the government's expert on whether... It, it turned on statelessness. Um, and I'm sure Eric and um, Adrian are going to be talking about that later. I won't bore you with it. But the... the um, uh, with my sort of hashed version of it, when you can hear from the experts. But um, uh, the, um, the problem with Abu Hamza um, was that he, he thought he'd been deprived of his Egyptian citizenship, he couldn't prove it. And the reason he couldn't prove it was because there were signs here and there, but he couldn't um, lay his hand on the definitive decree, or he couldn't find a government official willing to accept it. And um, the government's expert, and indeed um, Mr. Hamza's expert, were quite close. They were like, well, these are the steps that you have to go through to deprive somebody of their citizenship in Egyptian law. Some of these steps appear to have been gone through, but we don't know if they're final or not. There are circumstantial signs that he has been deprived. For instance, the Al Ahram, the um, government newspaper, published that he'd been deprived. And it would be thought that the government's newspaper would be unlikely to publish that, some, that, that fact if the government hadn't been behind it. So there were, there were signs. In, uh, when we got to court, the, the day before we got to court, we were served with a witness statement by the. Um, Secretary of State, and the um, witness statement said it's from Professor Professor General. I can't remember the last, last witness name. Anyway, he was a man of many, many qualifications. Actually, <laughs> <laughs> and he's a poet as well. I wanted to hear immensely, especially when I heard what he had to say. Because, um, but the day before we had this, before we had this sort of rambling statement explaining um, in, in sort of inferentially what might be the case and coming down essentially on the side of possibly him having been deprived of his Egyptian citizenship but not being conclusive. Then, the day before the hearing, we got a, a bullet point, um, point A, point B, point C. Yes, 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 he has been deprived of his Egyptian citizenship. I'm, I, I, 
I don't know if I'm putting um, too much emphasis on it to say that it looked like it had been drafted in a different style <laughs> by a different person, possibly on his instructions, we'll never know. Because when we came to the hearing, he held it up like this. <laughs> he, was, he was asked if a note verbal between the British authorities and the Egyptians um, had any, uh, or if any documents he had, had any definitive impact. And he explained that he'd received 73 pages of documents which he had to print off himself yesterday from the Secretary of State. He was most outraged about that. And then he <laughs> held up, he said, but there is one document of use. And he held up this note verbal. And the note verbal said something like, it was, there, were two, there was an exchange of documents. There was one note verbal saying, blah, 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 flowery diplomatic language. Can you give us the confirmation of Hamza's um, holding Egyptian citizenship? Like you said, you were there at a meeting, you went there. <laughs> and, then the, and then several months later, there's another note verbal saying, blah, 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 flowery language, honour to blah, 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 flowery. And then it says, um, there is no information we can give you on that subject. <laughs> And Professor, what's his name, held up, the Professor General, held up the document, close to the video link, <laughs> look, just like this, and sort of looking at Mitting, because he'd asked for the camera to be turned on, so we could see Mitting, and looking at it, and he said, this document would appear to have no taste or smell, but I, Professor General, whatever it is, can tell you that that is definitive evidence that the, um, that the um, Egyptians have taken away the citizenship from Abu Hamza. Dum dum! <laughs> <laughs> and, um, so, Secretary of State's Council leaned over to the camera and said, well, what about this statement? Professor General, whatever it is, his name is, held up the document and said, I received this yesterday. <laughs> what happened after that? Nothing happened. <laughs> they lost. <laughs> okay, in fact, it's quite interesting because Mr. Justice Mitting said, it's quite clear what's happened here. Mr. Fitzgerald was leading me. Quite clear what's happened here. Either Professor General Walker's name has been given permission to tell the truth, or he's been given permission to lie. <laughs> <laughs> and that was the end of that. So just briefly, G1. Oh, am I, am I, am I complete? OK, thanks for that. Just briefly, G1. G1 argued that he was unlawfully excluded because the procedure was unfair. He said he couldn't communicate. Um, and that one of the reasons he was entitled to a fair procedure was because he'd been deprived of his British citizenship, which had necessarily also deprived him of his European citizenship. And therefore, he was entitled to judicial scrutiny of the decision before it took effect. He was entitled to the wider fair hearing provisions of the Charter, what's called the of the Charter. All these things are in play. Um, Adrian's going to talk to you in more detail about how those things are in play and whether they are in play and the extent to which they are in play and why they're engaged. I'm not going to mention that now, I'm just going to say that Lord Justice Laws rubbished it. And the reason why he rubbished it was really very little to do with the substance of the argument. Because when, um, when we stood up to argue the case, in fact it was Hugh Sully arguing the case, he stood up and he opened the case. And Laws was just looking at him like this, tapping on his pen, letting him sort of say a few words, and then he just held up his hand and he said, Mr. Sully, your <coughs> client is a fugitive from justice. The reason he said that was because G1 had absconded from the UK while on bail for his violent disorder protest at the uh, um, Israeli embassy at the beginning of January 2009. And he'd run away while on bail. And as far as well, Justice Laws was concerned, that was the defining characteristic of the case. It's interesting to see that it doesn't really grapple with the European point. What he says is, I need a lot more argument about this before I'm going to go down that road because sovereignty being what it is, questions of citizenship are sovereign questions. In any event, he didn't like the facts of G1's case, and he didn't think G1 should have anything more than by way of procedural fairness than he was going to get anywhere in SIAC. Um, Interestingly, when that argument was drawn in front of Mr. Justice Mitting, he, did, he seemed it to, to be aware that there was a problem running in the Sudan. What he, what he didn't do when the, when the, when the hearing, when the, when the judgment came out, was to make a finding on that. What he said at the hearing was, the real question is whether he can go to a third country. And the Secretary of State's like, yeah, he'd go to a third country. And they're like, what third country? He doesn't have a passport. He, he he, you know, he's, the kind of allegations that are being made about him, um, are the kind of allegations which are going to give him difficulty wherever he goes. And there is now <coughs> there is now evidence in the public domain, I don't want to refer to any of it specifically, but to make it quite clear 
but he's been banned by various airlines <coughs> on grounds of being a Sudanese terrorist. So the idea that he'll be able to pitch up the board and say, yeah, what I'd like to do is um, come to your country for a bit, I don't know how long for because of the science things, I'd like to run my case, yeah, 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 I'm an alleged, ter I'm an alleged terrorist, and um, uh, I'm, uh, you know, I'd just like to run my appeal for their means, or I'd just have to stay there for as long as it takes. I mean, <laughs> how's that going to work? And it's interesting because in G1 they found that the burden was on um, G1 to show that he couldn't go anywhere else. So what, what, what's he supposed to do? What, go to, I mean, well, in fact, if we say G1, of course we're not talking about G1 at all, we're talking about representatives sitting in London trying to help us. It's, 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 it's a joke. It's a very sad joke. And of course, G1's been out of the country now for a very long time, and he's very frightened indeed. Okay. Um, procedural obligations, I've touched on those. Um, there are some issues around the development of the case law in the context of Article 8 procedural obligations being on a par with Article 6, um, fair trial rights, um, and being applied by Strasbourg in, um, in the deportation context. So it's a way of getting around Malia. Um, and then the common law, I don't know if you're familiar with the Osborne and Booth case, but Lord Reed talking about um, common law fairness and the importance of common law fairness, the importance of being heard. Um, SIAC proceedings are very adversarial um, and they're, as we know, a derogation from the normal standards of fairness. Real questions around the extent to which common law fairness can develop the argument about the availability of an in country right to appeal, where it can be shown that you can't get a fair hearing. And the, um, the, there's a case going to the Court of Appeal now, which has got permission, it's called S1 and others, where all those issues are going to be hopefully canvassed. So, in answer to my question, it didn't. And <coughs> I'd like to leave you with this thought. Thanks so much. Um, Alice comes to us from the uh, Bureau of Investigative Journalism. Uh, she leads a team at this non profit institution, which is based at our partner and competitor, City University, uh, which tracks uh, UK and US counter terrorism programs. Uh, the team has been tracking covert drone strikes since 2011 and won the Martha Gelman Prize for Journalism for the project just last year. And uh, it's a pleasure to welcome you today. Thank you very much. Um, so, yes, we, uh, my team at the Bureau of Investigative Journalism, um, has been tracking and reporting on deprivation of citizenship for about a year now under the title of Citizenship Revoked. And um, quite a lot of what we do is actually sort of outreach and talking to people about about these issues, as with our drones work. Um, so there is my email address. If anybody has any questions about anything that I'm talking about, please get in touch. Um, so we came to um, we came to be aware of deprivation of citizenship um, through this guy, Bilal Bajawi, he was killed in a drone strike in Somalia. So our team has been tracking drone strikes for about the past two years, covert secret drone strikes in Pakistan, Yemen and Somalia. And then in January 2012, there were reports that what was referred to as a former British citizen, Bilal Bajawi, had been killed in a drone strike in Somalia. And that really piqued the interest, particularly my former colleague Chris Woods, um, who started submitting FOIs around what a former British citizen is, and how many times these um, how many times these these powers had been used at the time. So in May 2012, when we started looking at this, there had been 16 cases revealed, of which 10 were under the 10 were under the coalition, and we started um, putting together information in any way that we could. I mean, I'm sure a lot of you know that this is not a public process. It's not one that the Home Office readily makes available for scrutiny. Um, so we had to work through. A combination of FOIs, asking for different combinations of details, um, trawling through SIAC records and so on, and the cooperation and the assistance of lawyers and other experts has been absolutely invaluable. And it's helped us to identify as many of the cases, um, as many of the cases that we have. It would have been impossible without their help. Um, so this is the number of cases, as we've been reporting, we've seen the number of cases rise really, really steeply. Um, a lot, of people, a lot of people have remarked today on how the number went up quite sharply with the introduction of the coalition and then last year there was a big spike. They, the coalition deprived more people of citizenship last year than in every other year of its government combined. 
Some of these cases are on fraud grounds, and we'll come back to that later because there's, there's a, bit of a, a bit of a mystery around that. But so at the moment, there are 41 cases since 2006, of which 37 are under the coalition. Um, there's one previous case, which is Abu Hamza, and he's already been discussed. So what I wanted to do today was to sort of explore these cases, as much, introduce you to as many of them as we can, because I think that they illustrate a lot of the different themes and a lot of the potential problems that, that have occurred. Um, there's, a much more, there's much more detailed information on the cases on our website, um, and you know, we've really tried to tell the story of as many of them as we possibly can. Um, the Home Office doesn't publish policies or guidance about the deprivation of citizenship or how it should be used, but we think that these cases provide a pretty good illustration of how the power is actually being used. Um, so Bilal Bajawi, what we found when we started investigating was that Bilal Bajawi, who was killed by a drone strike, he wasn't the only one to be killed by a drone. Um, this is Mohammed Saka. He was a childhood friend of Bilal Bajawi's. He was born in London to Egyptian-born parents. Um, his parents had never really considered their sons to be Egyptian citizens. Um, the month after Bilal Bajawi was killed, um, in so in February 2012, there were reports that an Egyptian commander had been killed in a US drone strike. And it was only much later that we realized that this was another former British citizen. Um, yeah, and that's what his father told my colleague Chris. No member of my family ever had an Egyptian passport. For the kids, it never crossed my mind that they would, be any, that they would have anything other than their British passports. So although they were functionally, you know, they could legitimately claim Egyptian citizenship through their parents, through, through their parents' nationality, They've never taken any steps to claim or assert British, to assert their Egyptian citizenship. And this is an issue that comes up a lot, is that there is a sort of implied citizenship which can come from your parents, and at times the Home Office has used that as a means for depriving people without making them stateless. Of course, when Saka lost his, when Saka's passport was cancelled, he was in Somalia at the time, when his passport was cancelled, um, he was left without a passport, without a means to travel, he was left functionally functionally stateless abroad and, um, well, as, as it turned out, quite vulnerable. Um, the cases of Saka and Bajawi are interesting because there is um, there was evidence from the jihadi side as well that they were quite, you know, quite involved in sort of in <coughs> insurgency in Somalia. So, uh, but these are some of the very rare cases where there is indication from both the Home Secretary's assertions and from sort of independent sources that there is any kind of that, that, that there is wrongdoing. In many of the other cases, all that we have is this sort of blanket assertion that someone is an Islamist extremist. And because the details of the case remain so opaque, we really can't make a judgment for ourselves about the relative merits of the deprivation um, situation. So of the 16 we, we identified initially, two were dead. Others were incarcerated in foreign jails. They ended up stranded overseas in precarious and really vulnerable situations. Um, as I pointed out earlier, there's been a really steep rise in deprivations onto the coalition. Um, these include, um, they're mo mostly national security cases. Where people have been deprived on conducive grounds it is mostly national security cases. Almost entirely men. Someone asked a question earlier about, about gender. And um, almost every single case is a man, apart from Anna Chapman, the Russian spy, who had a British passport through marriage. Um, they're almost all on terrorism grounds, but then recently, last, so in 2012, an individual called Mohammed Ibrahim lost his citizenship, having been convicted of a rape. And his, um, he, was, he was part of, a, part of a, a gang rape team, and he obtained his citizenship while he was in jail, and was stripped of it afterwards. So, you know, it's not, not a sympathetic case, but it is an indication that these, that these powers can be used in a variety of different ways. So when you ask the Home Office about deprivation, they will tell you again and again, citizen, citizenship is a privilege, not a right. I counted, I think, six times the Home Office told us that in the past year. But the number of people who've been killed, who have been deprived, they do include a number of people who've been born inside the UK. We've identified five cases. And when I'm talking about these cases, it's important to recognise that we've identified 19 cases. There are many more cases. So at least five individuals are born inside the UK. Mohammed Saka was born inside the UK, but there's also this man known only as S1. His parents came to the UK from Pakistan, and he was born here in 1963. His three sons, third, third generation British born, you know, born in London, 
they've all lost their citizenship. Um, they're, they're now stranded in Pakistan, and they claim that they are um, they're, they're, very, they're under a lot of pressure from local militant organisations who suspect them of being British spies. So you know they're they're really sort of stuck. And aside from people who are born inside the UK, um, it's worth noting that a lot of the other people who naturalised, who would now be covered by, by, these, by the new immigration bill, a number of them came to the UK as quite small children. Mohammed, um, sorry, Bilal Bajawi came to the UK aged less than one year. He came as a babe in arms. Mafi Hashi, who we'll get to in a minute, he naturalised at the age of nine. You know, a number of these people, even if they weren't born here, naturalised at a very, very young age. And that's really worth, worth bearing in mind. So there's a lot of cases that raise a lot of questions about, about what the function, yeah, one of the things we find from, from looking at the cases is that they really raise questions about what the function is of deprivation of citizenship. Why deprive someone of their citizenship? And some of them raise really quite uncomfortable questions about, about international complicity. Um, aside from the stories of Bajawi and Saka, where you're looking at two individuals who each lost their citizenship, and then went on to be killed in drone strikes very close to one another in Somalia. There are also cases like Mati Hashi, who's one of his, in some sense, he's kind of poster boy for deprivation of citizenship. Um, he gets everywhere. But so he came to the UK as a small child, as an asylum seeker from Somalia. He lost his British citizenship in June 2012. At that time, he'd already been in Somalia for a couple of years. He said that he'd gone home to look after his grandmother. He married. He had, he had a son. Um, he disappeared shortly after he lost his citizenship. He, he vanished inside Somalia. And I interviewed his father in December 2012, and his father told me that he feared that he was being held by US forces in Djibouti, which is the little country to the north of Somalia. Um, they feared, basically, a former inmate had told him that he'd been held alongside Mahdi Hashi. Um, it turned out a couple of days after I published the article that as we'd been speaking, and he'd been telling me that he feared his son was being, you know, mistreated by the Americans in Djibouti. At that point, he was at Mahdi Hashi had already been flown to America, and he was being held in secret in a jail in New York. And they, it, this was only revealed, his secret detention was only revealed when he sort of popped up in a Manhattan courtroom on Friday afternoon, the Friday before Christmas. Um, so he'd been through secret imprisonment. He's now in he's now in top security jail. He's in the same wing as Abu Hamza and Bin Laden's son, and he's wait, he's awaiting trial in you know really restrictive solitary confinement conditions. He's been on hunger strike and so on, and um, yeah, I mean he's he's in quite a dire state, and he won't be getting to um, he won't be getting to trial until next year at the earliest. Um, but I think this really illustrates um, one of the reasons for which you might make someone stateless. This quote from the Foreign Office, when his parents were trying to track him down when they thought, when they feared he was in custody in Djibouti, they wrote to the Foreign Office for help and they were told that he's no longer a British national and such, as such has no right to consular assistance. So there's a question there about what protections British citizenship removes from you. Another case that also raises questions about sort of chickens and eggs and international complicity is B2, who's a Vietnamese-born graphic designer. Um, he was arrested at Heathrow and accused of having been to Yemen, where he'd been accused of working as a, as a graphic designer for Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula. Um, as his hearings were going through, it was revealed that he is also under extradition proceedings to the United States. And that really, really what's, what's the link between him losing his citizenship and the United States wanting to extradite him? His case is going to the Supreme Court soon. He's arguing statelessness. I guess if they put past the new amendments and they can they can make him status, they don't have to ask the question about where, where they're going to send him because the Americans already want. Yeah, he's also re-arguing the Rockman EU law from his state. Yeah, it's got permission. So uh, yeah, but he's he's been what, he's been in Belmarsh for three years now or something. No substantive grounds, just on the arguing these procedural cases. The government strenuously denied the suggestion that there's any kind of international um, complicity function behind any of these decisions. They've said that in connection to Bajawi and Saka, um, James Brokenshire, the Home Office Minister, he said this week, they are two clearly separate issues and there is nothing to indicate in any respect that they are linked. So. Um, other cases appear to be um, effectively to change the locks to keep someone out of the country. Um, the government's recently denied that this, this is one of these is a deprivation of citizenship. It said that uh, well, it's true people have been deprived while outside the UK, but it's not a particular tactic. 
<coughs> so um, we've identified of the sort of 50, of the 18 cases that we've identified since 2006, three of them were inside the country, and Alton Arusha was actually a case of fraud, and we've identified um, 15 where they were where they were outside the country, including L1, which is and F2. And F2, okay, there we go, uh, which is particularly particularly scandalous because um, in, that, in that occasion they actually deliberately waited until he was out of the country. They cancelled proceedings to strip him when he returned to the country and then when he, came, when he left the country again, four days later, they, they issued the new proceedings. Um, other issues about it are that with deprivation, and um, we've talked about this in Sorry, um, Alice, is that weasel words? I do not accept it's a particular term. You're very cynical. <laughs> <laughs> that was sarcastic. I think it might be. Yes. <laughs> yes, I think I think that might be. That might. Be. I mean, in the rest of the paragraph, it goes on to say, well, sometimes they're out of the country and sometimes they're in the country. You just can't. But I mean, yeah, it, it does appear to be a, a state of weasel words. Um, so with deprivation and decisions, there is no need for sign-off in advance for Theresa May from either the security services or any kind of judicial approval in advance. So the only effective, well, but that's different actually from other sort of counter-terrorism powers. For Reaper, for example, there's an independent commissioner. For TPIMS, there's an independent, there's a QC who goes through and scrutinizes, and there's routine publishing on those cases. And there, there is a sort of a form of independent scrutiny, whereas this power goes completely under the radar, effectively. So the only effective check on it is the judiciary. And as Amanda's already said, it can take years. And you're, you're fighting essentially with one hand behind your back because you can't see what evidence is, is there actually is against it. Um, and it, I think a, a case that illustrates how um, sort of unilateral Theresa May's decisions can be is um, Y1, who was born in Afghanistan. And he was detained by British forces in Afghanistan. So he, I can't remember exactly when he obtained British citizenship, but he, he'd gone back to Afghanistan at some point. He claimed that he went to live under Sharia law. Because, um, he was sick of Britain, and um, he was arrested by UK forces in Afghanistan. And he was about deprived of his citizenship because they had they had a real issue on their hands when they when they arrested him. They couldn't hand him over to the Afghan police because of torture fears. Um, so they didn't really know what to do with him. It turns out it turned out in court hearings that the security services had told Theresa May that their preferred option for him was to bring him back to the UK and put him under surveillance. Theresa May spoke with other cabinet colleagues and said, that's not happening, we're, we're depriving him. And the judge actually ruled this. So this appears to be a political decision made, made using executive powers, um, where, where she's sort of going, circumventing her own security systems, her own security people. And why one continues to protest his innocence, and as a marker of how slow the SIAC proceedings are, I've been following these cases for a year now, why one is the only substantive trial that I've so far seen, and it really illustrated like, the, the problems of secret evidence. Um, at times as well, even the judiciary hasn't really proven a sufficient obstacle, and this is something that's going to come up a lot today. al um, so we've had a lot of the background of the case and so on. Um, he successfully argued that he had been made stateless, um, and we've covered that already. So his citizenship was reinstated effectively by the Supreme Court decision on October 9th. Three weeks later, they issued a new deprivation of citizenship order, effectively sending him all the way back to the beginning again. And in SIAC last week, um, yeah, number one, that does illustrate a certain sort of uh, contempt for the decisions of the court. Um, number two, SIAC, in SIAC last week, um, Justice Irwin commented that there was the appalling prospect of even if they managed to successfully argue his case all over again, that the immigration bill would pass and then they'd be able to deprive him for a third time because statelessness would no longer be a barrier. I mean, this, he referred to it as an endless and circular case. And I think a lot of people in SIAC really feel like they're in Grand Pop Day. Um, so the appalling prospect wasn't his appeal succeeding? The no. comma's just a bit worrying in that sense. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, sorry. No, sorry. The, the, the appalling prospect was the third. Well, it's the third order. The third, okay. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And the appalling prospect is the bit that. Uh, I'm, wonder, I'm wondering what was appalling about it. I think he. I think he genuinely. There was a sort of a note of desperation about doing the whole case again and then having to do it all over again. I mean, he, so he practically. What about the impact on? 
Mm -hmm. No, no, no. He's, he's in Turkey, he's stuck with his, with his family. Won't it be sort of struck out as abusive? I mean, as, as summarily struck out as abusive, because it clearly is abusive. Um, I don't, I'm not, I think his lawyers might be arguing that. It's, it's only been, I've only been to preliminary hearings. Oh, so. yeah, yeah. They did the same in MK. Did they? They legislated the yeah. MK Tunisians in country right of appeal away. I know, but that was, that, that was after the legislation, whereas this is preemptive of any legislation. True. Yeah. Um, that's what they did in all the certification cases as well under the Justice and Security Act. If I was a merciless cynic, I might suggest it was a placeholder deprivation order um, waiting until a new deprivation that's order. Well, that's what you're saying. Yeah. 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 It's preemptive. So perhaps, because of course the deprivation order isn't an appealable decision, they could JR that. <coughs> yeah. yeah. It's just a fresh, yeah. it's just a fresh order that's come in. He's got, he's got very good counsel. Which time? Uh, yes. Um, I'm not. I'm not. I've got to confess, I'm not completely certain of the secondary grounds because the solicitor's just changed. But um, yeah. So I mean, one of the really striking aspects of deprivation, um, which I think you touched on a little bit, is the really perfunctory nature of the process and how short the notice periods you get are, how short the appeal windows are, how truncated your chance to make your case is. And Arjena's case also illustrates that quite well. In his first, when he was first stripped of his citizenship in December 2007, his lawyers were contacted a couple of weeks in advance and they were invited to make representations and they were warned that this was coming and they were told, you know, give us your side of the story why you should remain British. When his second deprivation of citizenship was, order was um, executed, his lawyers were sent an email an hour before the order was signed. Uh, so, I mean, it was, it was literally just wham, bam. And as Irving said in the, in the hearing, there is no, the statute doesn't actually say how much notification you're entitled to. So effectively, you could, be, you could have lost your citizenship before you've even opened the, even opened the envelope on the previous. <coughs> According to G1, you're not entitled to any notification. You just get the, the order, you get the, you get the notice, <coughs> and you get the order, that's fine. That's all. Laws, laws, yeah, laws. You, can, you, can, you can open the envelopes so in, a, in, a, in a sequence, can't you? It's, um, and the notification processes can be slight, slightly bizarre, and I'm not a lawyer, so I, but they don't sound very proper or very legal to me. So, I mean, in, in Hashi's case, the notification of his deprivation of citizenship was delivered to his father's house. When his sister refused to open the envelope, um, they, it was delivered again by hand, and um, Mr. Hashi, his father, was called <coughs> to say there is a no, there is an important notice here that your son needs to know about. Please let him know. I'm not sure of any other legal processes where it's acceptable to sort of serve by insisting that someone's relatives tell you the information. He had 28 days to appeal, as you do if you're overseas. At the point when his appeal window closed, he was in custody um, in, of the Djibouti authorities as, as his appeal window closed and yet his lawyer, uh, and yet the Home Office claims that he shouldn't be allowed to appeal on, on time grounds because, because he, he had his chance effectively. Um, there are other cases as well, there's an individual called E2 who found out that he'd lost his citizenship as he tried to board a plane back to, um, back to London at um, I think it was Dubai Airport and he was sort of pulled out of the queue by a man in a suit who took his passport away and they threw him in the cells for a night and told him he was no longer British. And of course L1, the uh, most clear example of the sort of appalling abuse of process that I can think of. Um, yeah, and lots of cases as well. Even once you manage to lodge your even once you manage to lodge your appeals, you'll be stuck in preliminaries, as I've already said. Why once is the only case that I've yet seen go to substantive grounds. It takes years to get to get through all of this. And then of course there's the uh, there's the secret the secrecy aspect. You don't actually know what you're fighting against. Um, a lot of people have claimed that they're stuck in really vulnerable situations overseas, along with um, along with G1. I'd add um, S S1, T1, U1, and V1, the, the, the family. So um, the younger son of that family is um, has developmental disabilities. For a long time, he wanted and his mother wanted to come back to the UK, but they couldn't because they were basically prevented from prevented from it because the family would have been broken up. They claim that they are under threat from local militant groups, and the British government will neither confirm nor deny whether it's communicated with the Pakistani authorities about their case. And it says that if they communicated with the Pakistani authorities after they were no longer British, 
that might not be such a problem. So, I mean, they, they feel that they are in an extremely vulnerable position. Um, Mohamed Saka as well, um, one of the two um, men who died in Somalia. Mohamed Saka was, he initially launched appeal proceedings and then he decided that it was too dangerous because he felt that he was likely to be, he felt his communications were likely to be used to target him. Um, so he dropped, he dropped his appeal at a very early stage. So the cases that we have been able to identify, they obviously raise a number of concerns about process, about um, sort of the ways that the orders are executed and so on. And at that time, <coughs> the fact that two of them are dead, one of them is in custody, it makes it all the more important to us that we identify the remaining cases that we, that we, that we manage to build the clearest picture of how this power is being used as we can. Um, so, but we, so we saw this really steep rise in 2013, and yet we only know of one of the orders that's been issued for 2013, that Mr. Al second order. So information provided to the House of Commons by Theresa May indicates that 27 <coughs> cases since 2006 have been on conducive grounds. So mapping that against various parliamentary question answers and so on, there's a lot of deduction that goes on here. We think that 11 or 12 of last year's cases are on fraud grounds. There are a couple of cases which a previous parliamentary question revealed are on both fraud and conducive grounds, and we don't know how that fits into Miss May's rubric. We don't know how you get deprived on both fraud and conducive grounds. <laughs> <laughs> and we don't know whether they're in the 27 or if they're in, or if they're elsewhere. You, you, know, know. you know, Alice, I'm, I'm aware that there are at least 40, um, or possibly more, Albanian stroke consequent deprivations, and they're not featuring in your figures, and I'm wondering... Are they deprivations or are they anonymous? Because oh, there's yeah, there's a dispute over that, that's true. So they're not, they're not where they say it's a nullity, they're not including it in the deprivation. Yeah, I don't think, yeah, yeah. yeah. So there's a different process which is also going on, whereby... Yeah. Um, that's true, actually. They're annulling, they're annulling. Yeah. Um, among the 20 cases that we were told happened last year, there was an Albanian and a former Yugoslavian, or some Al a quantity of Albanians and former Yugoslavians. So intuitively, I think that they go there. But with fraud cases, we have even less chance of identifying who they are, because they'll go to the Immigration and Asylum Tribunal. Um, that's not, you know, one case a week, like in SIAC. That's hundreds of cases every day. I and mean, we just we just would really struggle to identify them. Alice, what's your Ibrahim case, though? Because well, you talked Ibrahim. about, I mean, a gang rape one, and I'm just wondering whether that is I like coming back into the, questioning the initial citizenship. I wonder whether he is one of the fraud and conducive That's what I'm wondering, yeah. Because I think that there is a... So, apparently, he was in the process of acquiring British citizenship as he was convicted. Is it a good character requirement? Too? Yes. Sorry? Is it a good character requirement? Yes. Because all of this has been reformed at the other end too, of course, the access to citizenship through good character. But would the good character fall into fraud? Or would mm. that? Mm. Um, so I, I wonder whether he was supposed to be if you them. misrepresented and, and therefore led the yeah, It's misrepresentation as well. If you were of good character, yeah. then you would, you would have, have achieved, you'd pass the good character test through misrepresentation. Right, okay. So it could be. So that's incredibly broad. That could apply to. If you and fail to crime. declare your criminal convictions or to declare that you are currently on trial, yeah. in the, for, the demand for your naturalisation form is that you declare all criminal proceedings mm -hmm. in which you are involved. It depends so, on the nature of your bad character, doesn't it? I mean, if you're just a bad character, you don't have to declare it. If you've been convicted, Well, if you read the, current, wor if you read yeah. the current wording of the form and guidance, even is, if so it's, it's even if it's something you don't think is bad, the form says if you think anyone could anyone make that think that made bad. you of bad character, then you should write it in this book. So I feel there's Ibrahim and there's one other who we've been told exists in a PQ, um, who where it may be something similar, where they are just trying to make damn sure that they are out of the country. Um, so there's a mystery around the figures, effectively. We don't, and we don't know. If you were giving them the benefit of that, you said that 27, there, there have been 27 fraud case, um, conducive cases, which includes those two. But, I mean, they, yeah. If you're looking at impersonation as a ground of fraud, it's in the nullity cases, that won't go to the tribunal. There's no right of appeal against the declaration of nullity. It would be 
you'll have to challenge it by way of judicial review. Um, there's, a, there's a test case, Stephen Nafta's doing it with yeah, Tsunami. Yeah, on the meeting at the end of February. Yeah. So, yeah. So you've got even less, you've got even even, even less recourse, which is a separate, it's, it's a separate problem. But so looking at the conducive cases, um, everybody I spoke to, you st you're still looking at a 50% rise, roughly, in um, in conducive cases from six to nine, which is still a big jump. Um, everybody I spoke to said instinctively it's, it's Syria, but we can't find cases. Uh, there have been three appeals to SIAC, they haven't come through yet. One of them is Mr. Al Jeddah's. So that's only two, two cases that have appealed on national security grounds. But um, in the meantime, politicians have been furiously running up the flagpole that they are tough on Syria and tough on the causes of Syria. And they've said in every discussion that we've had about Syria, we've also discussed the dangers of British people traveling to Syria and the dangers of terrorists returning home. Not unrelated to that is why downstairs in the House of Commons we're debating how we should be able to take away people's citizenship. That's a very interesting use of words. British people travelling to Syria and terrorists returning home. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> there appears to be some kind of a sort of... Yes. Uh, yeah. 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 Well, that's the law. <laughs> 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 I've quite interesting on the Who's advising the government that there is a link between national security risk and people going off to fight in a foreign war? I don't, I don't, I'm, I'm, I'm anxious about who, you know, because part of what we, we do, and you do it over a period of time, you become really clear that there's a whole terror economy of experts and empire builders, and it's just as rife with other people's ambition and thinking yeah. bollocks as everywhere, every, every other field of life, every other field of life, and, and I'm quite anxious about the, how, the opacity of how, of the, of the um, terror information commodity, mm. and how, you know, because it, it, it feeds into general uh, ability to make more repressive norms, which is what the government wants to do. It's also not clear to me that taking away someone's citizenship goes any way towards mitigating the risk that they might pose. So, for example, in Y1, the guy who was in Afghanistan last year, he was actually stripped of his, cit they, he was stripped of his citizenship. But the main charge against him was that he'd been planning attacks on British and US forces in Afghanistan. Now, what purpose did taking away his British citizenship serve? He wasn't apparently interested in returning to Britain or planning Br attacks on Britain. So taking away his citizenship would only appear to leave him vulnerable to... Sort of but it would, it would, it would, it would um, affect his ability to travel. So his British passport would facilitate his free movement. They would probably want to part of their disruption, mm -hmm. that would be the national security objective. But it would also allow them to hand him over to the, to the Afghan He went military. into hiding because he did a drone strike. Have mm -hmm. yes. you inquired about this? Because everybody tells you that it's instinctively Syrians returning mm -hmm. that have been deprived right now that were last year. Have you put in a free of information? Yes. Uh, requested and they haven't replied to it. Um, well, the number <coughs> of cases are mainly anonymized. Um, the government will not discuss individual cases. Um, and we're, where we've looked, only three cases of appeals to SIAC from last year. So, I mean, the, the main routes of information are through freedom of information, SIAC cases, lawyers and helpful people, and um, parliamentary questions, and none of those appealed it, information on the, on the Syria returnees. We're also tapped into, we're also speaking to experts in Syria, and what they told us is that it would be a badge of honour so it would get around. So it's not perfectly clear that it has yet been used on people coming back from Syria, but the signs that they're making, the, the noises that they're making, whether it's a deterrent or whether, you know, or whether it is actually a policy that's being discussed, the noises they're making is that this rise is connected, connected to Syria. Can I ask you something else about the Syria case, which is, I don't really understand really what's going on in Syria any more than anybody else does. But I mean, I know that we don't like the Syrian government, and therefore, is it also axiomatic that people who are fighting <coughs> against the Syrian government are terrorists? I mean, I think the, the you know your question would Laurie Lee and George Orwell have been stripped of their citizenship <coughs> um, had these laws been in place in the past? I think it depends which question. Syrian resistance you join. So there are a lot of. I think if you go to join the Free Syrian Army, who are the Democrats, who are sort of on our side, they're the good guys. Um, then I think you might be viewed slightly differently from if you go to the, if you go to join ISIS, which is the sort of Al Qaeda allied. Um, well, yeah, no, not anymore. They just be disavowed. It's related to that issue with the I mean, our case business, and we've got a lot of cases of people from Syria 
but not so much their citizenship being revoked, but their passports being taken away. Mm -hmm. um, and again, I don't understand this concept because if somebody is coming to Syria and the idea, idea of the, behind taking their citizenship or their passport is that it was a threat to Britain, within Britain, by taking the passport and depriving them of going to Syria and getting their martyrdom or whatever they're after over there, you are effectively frustrating them and creating a, a greater terror threat to this mm -hmm. country if that state is their intention to cause harm. Because you're keeping them within the country. So it doesn't make sense. Now, the other thing they're doing is also prosecuting for training for terrorism and uh, instigating terrorism and all these other issues. So there's so many other measures available. And I can't see any rhyme or reason why they would pick one option above the other. And I'm just wondering whether you have. It seems to be a mixed bag. It seems to be that if you are inside the UK, you may be eligible for a TPIM, whereas if you are outside the UK, then citizenship declaration would be more appropriate. If you are just coming back to the UK, they're not very keen on TPIMs now because they've proven expensive and they also end. So, you know, maybe passport declaration is one of the steps that they can take. I mean, at the end of the day, we're working from the outside here as well. There is, there is so little information about the nature of these allegations and and the, yeah, there's so little transparency about exactly exactly how this power is being used that we are working, you know, with a jigsaw puzzle created from outside. Then. Is there any suggestion that there's anything more sinister about the drone strikes and their general sinisterness? So is there any suggestion that those guys were in any way targeted? Yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, Bajawi had been wounded in a drone strike the summer before. I should have mentioned that. That would have been really salient. Um, Bajawi was wounded alongside a senior Al-Shabaab commander in a drone strike in Somalia in summer, I think it was June 2011. Um, and he was then killed in um, in, the, in the drone strike. In the drone strike that killed Mohammed Saka, the target was described, I think by a US official speaking to Reuters from memory, as, a, um, as an Egyptian commander. And that was Saka. So... Yeah, they, they, were, they were the targets of those two strikes. And, I mean, in the case of Bajawi, from the eulogies that have been put out on him and so on, he does seem to have been a, a, a fairly senior target um, in, in, the, in the area. We don't know so much about that. How do we know about the, the June 2011 <coughs> strike? Um, through our work tracking drone strikes. So we, we track drone strikes. We monitor drone strikes in Pakistan, Somalia, and Yemen. And how did you know about the loud that you moved there? How, how was he on your radar? What did you Find out later. We found that out later. Yeah, it was. It was in. So okay. when the when the commander was killed in June 2011, it was in. Yeah, there was a jihadi autobiography which described how he'd been wounded, um, and there was there were reports that he, he there were already reports that he'd been wounded in a drone strike the previous year, and then there were very, there were very few drone strikes in Somalia compared to other places, and. Um, yeah, there are reports about how when a particular commander was killed, he was also injured, and the job and Saka took care of him. This was an autobiography by somebody else who was on the scene. Or? Yeah, by right. it's, it's a um, so what a lot of jihadi groups will do is publish martyrdom statements after people have been killed. I see. In this case, Al Shabab published a martyrdom. It's like a potted biography of uh, of his of Fabulal, Yeah. Uh, so <coughs> a potted biography is it of his many achievements and so on, and yeah. It has Thanks, Alice. Um, I'm wondering about the kind of temporal shift and whether there is one between uh, stripping people of their citizenship when they're in the country versus out of it. Like, um, you listed three cases you had, I think it was, of people stripped of their citizenship in country. Are any of them recent or are they all B2. kind of a while ago? So B2, B2 is, is recent. B2 is so they're what, still December considering it. Okay. He was very much, he was picked up at the airport as he came in. Um, right. I'm just trying to think what the other two cases are. It's Arusha and... Demushi. The, no, they were, yeah, um, Arusha and Ibrahim was the other one. Oh, okay, yeah, so Ibrahim was in summer 2012. So they, they are fairly Okay. Um, so but again, not... both of them are, neither of them are sort of roaming the streets. Yeah. Um, they're each in, in incarceration. Yeah. Okay. As well, and I guess the point with Ibrahim is so that you can um, deport him the minute he finished serving his sentence. And it appeared to be that the family put uh, the family of the victim put pressure on. Basically, they found out that he was getting his, getting his citizenship as it was going, as as they were in the trial proceedings and kicked off about it. Okay. So we haven't identified any of the cases from last year. Um, Al Jeddah. 
yeah. Apart from that, no, they, they are. If anybody has any information on them. <laughs> <laughs> some, some people just don't know they've been deprived yet. Yeah. No, it's perfectly possible that you wouldn't know you've been, mm -hmm. you've been deprived. And the fact that there are sort of potentially six people out there who have who've been deprived on national security grounds and then have we, and yet we don't know what happens to them. Or, you know, why haven't they lodged appeals? There's another incident, one from Pakistan, a Pakistani who was deprived in 2009. And we've never found out what happened to him either. He never lodged an appeal. I mean, some people presumably just think to hell with it, but others... You wonder, you wonder what's what's happened to them, and I think in the context where two two people have been killed and other people are being rendered and so on, it becomes really important to try and piece together what the consequences are. Um, so, I mean, as at debates around the immigration bill, the initial debates were very rushed and very misunderstood. A lot of them really misunderstood the provisions, and obviously it passed by a crashing majority in the House of Commons, but they were given no real chance to digest it. Labour has since um, tabled a debate where they, on this week, on, on Tuesday, where they raised concerns about the presumption of guilt for terror suspects. Diane Abbott raised some really valid points about why, why should we be presuming that these individuals are guilty? Why are they not being tried? Why are they not being charged? She also raised concerns about um, about two tier two tier citizenship and so on. Um, and it's led to some uh, an element of soul searching around the current laws and how they have been used. Um, what it does appear, though, they've mentioned Al Jeddah repeatedly in the proceedings of bringing, in the, in the process of bringing this, this new amendment through, and it does appear that this is a continuation of a pattern whereby they appear to make the laws around specific individuals. So they wrote, they rewrote the laws to include terror suspects and then deprived Abu Hamza. They rewrote the laws so that you could be conducive to the public good rather than having done something prejudicial, and then they deprived David Hicks, who obviously. Was only a, he was only a British citizen for a matter of hours. He was um, he was given British citizenship in his cell at Guantanamo Bay, and they took it away the same day. Um, but they wouldn't have been able to do that if the test was still to have done something seriously prejudicial to the public good. And now it appears that they're rewriting the laws again for Al Jeddah and for B2 um, for those two cases, which is really really sort of unpalatable. Um, so. Yeah, I'm mean, looking at these cases, each of them, they're like Russian dolls, aren't they? You start unpacking each of them and they, they all come up with different issues and concerns and so on. Um, a question that I have is about the UN Declaration of Human Rights. It says that you, you are entitled, nobody should be uh, arbitrarily deprived of their, of their citizenship. But at what point does this process become arbitrary? Is a question that I would ask. Um, obviously the consequences have been really, really really serious um, for people. So yeah, I mean, these are the areas of concern as we've identified them. Um, but yeah, the arbitrary is the process. The appeals process as we've already covered. The enormously serious consequences for people. You know, you've got people scared of being people trapped, vulnerable overseas, people who are being killed, people who are being imprisoned. You know, human rights concerns and the discrimination aspect of it as well. So an individual who was of Indian Heritage, because India doesn't allow dual citizenship um, at any, so you, you lose your, your Indian citizenship when you become British. Even someone who was born here, whose parents are Indian, is less is not able <coughs> to this process. Whereas someone who is born here of Pakistani parentage, as S1 and his family found out, is still vulnerable. So there is this sort of discrimination, discriminatory aspect. And one of the most dangerous aspects, I think, is mission creep. Is so. At the moment, these are mostly counter-terrorism cases, but Ibrahim's case, you'll see it being used for crimes for the first time. And in there was an individual called Trenton Oldfield, the boat race protester, who lost, who you know, he was nearly deported from the country on conducive grounds. He was judged not conducive to the public good. I mean, he was an idiot, but he was not. <laughs> <laughs> it, that, that, does, does that merit, you know, should you be able to lose, should conducive grounds cover idiocy? I don't think it's but a non-citizen. <laughs> I mean, a non-citizen. Yeah, but yeah. but those but those words are not conducive to the public good yeah, grounds well, being used to cover the process. In, in law, there's no difference. Yeah. And yeah. when we argue for a higher threshold in S1, Mitting said, forget it, the words are the words. And, I mean, that case is going on appeal to the Court of Appeal. But it's a bit like, and it's quite tricky because there are so many, it's objectionable on so many, it bristles with objections. It's, you, you're, the first um, application for, for leave to appeal got knocked back because there was just so much in the, 
in there. I mean, we've got permission now, but it, no, we have to rationalise it down. It, it's all so objectionable. Where do you start? Yeah, yeah, exactly. It sort of it does bristle with wrongness, as you say. Um, in America, we've already touched on this a little bit, but in America, they've um, they've ruled several times. The Supreme Court ruled several times against citizenship declaration, declaration of citizenship. Um, in one of the most in one of the cases, they said that. Any citizenship that can be revoked is uh, fleeting, good at the moment is acquired, but subject to destruction by the government at any time. And that's what this government has really, has really shown. So I wanted to finish with some of the... Making contact with these cases has been really difficult in many cases, partly because they're in very vulnerable situations, they're very mistrustful of the media, um, there's, there's, there are numerous challenges, as, as I'm sure you can imagine, but these are some of, these are some of the... <coughs> in their own rights. Um, Muhammad Hashi said, you lose a bit of faith. We were, sworn in, we were sworn in God's name, in the Quran, that this is our country. He's talking about when they acquired British citizenship. He said, we have to be faithful, we have to protect it, and, that, and that's what it was when he took the oath. But now, if you see things like that, talking about the loss of his son's citizenship, easily happening, you think it's only you. So he's talking about a one-way obligation, that his, that his son lost all the protections. You don't have anyone that's taking care of you that's considering your situation. An individual called E2, said, yeah, when someone's citizenship is revoked, if he's a criminal, he should be put in jail, otherwise he should be free and have his passport revoked. Um, he, protests, he says that it was all a big misunderstanding, and he's, uh, he's, he was turned back at the preliminary appeal um, because he was appealing out of time. And Gamal Saka, um, Mohammed um, Saka's father, he said, I'll never stop blaming the British government for what they did to my son. They broke my family's back. He believes very clearly that the loss of his son's citizenship proved really wrong. Any questions? Thank you. Thank you very much. Those were two fantastic presentations. Um, we're supposed to have a break. In fact, we're supposed to have a break a few minutes ago. Um, we can still have a break. I might suggest that we save up questions for the general discussion um, so that we can actually get to that. We've got a, a panel of three coming up. So why don't I suggest that we have a break now, and if you're okay, mm -hmm. we'll return with questions. I have to go. Oh, you have to go? Oh, well, I'm sure I'm going to We can have a break later. No, 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 of course. Oh, you have to go anyway to me. Yeah, I mean, I can't, I can't think of the office on my face. I see. Um, well, well, I don't want, to, I don't want that to alter your plans. I was going to say, okay, then with, with a bit of indulgence from... Uh, our colleagues who are on the next panel, if you don't mind, if we can have a few minutes of questions that while right. Amanda's here. Sure. Sorry. Then, Amanda, I don't know if you're staying on, uh, because one, one question I have for you as someone who's involved in the cases, you know, with, with, with couples with, with what I'll be dealing with in, in terms of public international law, is have there been an application to the UN Human Rights Committee referring to ICCPR Article 12 4 or other provisions in relation to any of these cases? No, I mean not not none of the cases that I cases that I've been involved in. Um, uh, one of the problems about that is the requirement to exhaust domestic remedies, and so this is the issue. But um, I think reliance is certainly being placed on those provisions, the ICCPR, Article 12, the right to, um, can't be deprived arbitrarily of the right to leave a country, that sort of thing, and um, and the right to return to your country, I mean, they're, they're, they're all, as well as the, the UN Declaration, I mean, the, the question of arbitrariness is definitely being raised as an appeal ground in terms. Um, um, the problem with the statelessness stuff, as you're going to probably come on to, is that the degree of protection that's offered is actually quite limited by Article 8, so... Um, uh, and that's a problem we came up against in um, S1. Um, but there are sort of the other sort of tangential arguments that are being raised um, relate to um, yeah the, 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 the international conventions and the impact on the, the lawfulness of the decision, which is otherwise arbitrary. Um, another question for both of you, because you 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 know the facts of the case is much better than, than most of us would. Uh, which is this: in terms of the countries where people are being deposited by by deprivation. I mean, it, it, it's very apparent to me that no one, no, no one's being deprived of British citizenship in Germany or France or Italy. Um, Turkey, of, of, of course, is an EU candidate country and the Council of Europe country. 
but broadly, um, would, you say, would you say there's a hierarchy of states that seems to inform um, whether um, deprivation is taking place? I, I, what I'm about to say might be a little bit controversial, but the uniting factor and the, the hierarchy and so far as it arise, arises in the context of all the cases that I've come across is A, are you a Muslim? B, do you know other people that we don't like? And that's about it. It really matters little what country you come from. Thanks a lot. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah. Yeah, it's just something of a follow-on question. The Human Rights Committee has got a general comment which says the right of anybody to return to their own country, and it said that their own includes a country of which you are not a citizen but have long-term residence rights. Has that got any weight in the UK courts, or is it just? Ooh, a I, 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 that that sort of parallel argument is not something that's not a, a road I've gone down. Um, uh, in, in the, it, I, I, I think the, the, the primary. It would, be a, it would be a secondary argument, clearly, because the most it, important it thing would. is citizenship. But, 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 but they could come back to the country and then argue about citizenship. Yeah, well, well, exactly. Well, well yes. And, and well, yeah. And I, I suppose it's right that the emphasis of all the arguments thus far have been, certainly as far as I'm concerned, procedural. In, in that Alice is right, very few of these cases have actually got to the point where you're arguing some kind of sub substantive merits. Um, because. But I, you know, I could, no, I could see that. I don't, I'm going to have a look at that. that because that's quite interesting. Thanks very much. <laughs> that, that sort of reminds me of something which I read not that long ago. Gerald Newman's book on strangers to the Constitution, where he's arguing that um, where the U.S. government has its constitutional rights to um, uh, distinguish between aliens and others, and books and sedition acts, etc., and keep people at a certain distance equally has the right then to extend these constitutional rights to those people who are there, which would include some form of judicial process to at least debate uh, one status. You know, there's one procedural uh, point that I haven't um, touched on, but which is sort of really up for grabs now in, in a way that it wasn't sort of a year or so ago. And that is that um, there's a real sense in which the UK, by depriving people in circumstances in which they can't travel and they can't access assistance, is placing them at risk of their breaches of their human rights. And I'm thinking of Article 2 and Article 3. Now, um, the problem thus far has always been the Secretary of State's argument in, in, <coughs> in terms of a case called Bankovic and some other jurisprudence that's been, um, that, that, that this is a jurisdictional issue, that there's no an Article 1 jurisdiction that will bind them in the observance of their human rights outside the territory of the UK. Um, and, but because of the um, Supreme Court's decision on, in Smith and the MOD this year, uh, where what, what, what was the, the approach of the court when looking at, at the um, UK's liability for actions of its troops abroad, um, largely, that's been the context in which it's been discussed. But what, what what, what the court was vexed by was the idea, the prohibition on what's called dividing and tailoring um, rights, so that you could have some territories in which you would have rights, other where you wouldn't have rights, that sort of thing. Um, and some contexts or circumstances in which you would have rights but not in others, and the, and the, the, the emphasis of the Stras Strasbourg jurisprudence was to avoid that. However, what the, the Supreme Court has made clear in Smith and the MOD, and it's a judgment which is well worth reading, um, is that those, that, that, that concept, that analysis is really outdated. It's been superseded by other cases. I'm thinking of, um, gone from my mind now, I've gone with Fran. Not, um, Al, 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 Adrian in Strasbourg. Wait, um, <laughs> 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 um, And what's that um, the case of um, it's Al actions of trips? Yeah, Al Skaney. Thank you very much. Al Skaney. Al Skaney. Uh, and so, so it's taken them all forward, and so there is a real sense if you can establish a sufficient jurisdictional link between the action of the government concerned, who is bound by, and they're uh, bound by the, the convention, and the impact of the risk to the person concerned, regardless of where they are in the world. What more jurisdictional link could there be than the exclusive sovereign competence of a, of a country to take away the citizenship of other citizens? You know? So. Which is both procedurally, because of course Article 3 has procedural obligations attached. Article 2 has procedural obligations attached. Obligations of inquiry, obligations of investigation, obligations on the Secretary of State to look at whether they put them at risk, rather than saying you prove it, you call the inside. All those issues 
So are you saying that in theory one could raise an Article 3 claim on the basis that by stripping someone of their citizenship when they're abroad you're putting them at risk of torture and arrest and everything else? Absolutely. Yeah. The Home Office has just, yeah. have you seen the legal memo that they put out around the new amendment? The Home Office is, is claiming that it has no obligation under Article 2 and Article 3 because of the jurisdictional issues. But if there's already case law, they put this out on the 30th of January, if there's already case law... And S1 has got permission to argue that very point. In which I'm there by Stephanie Harrison. So what, you would go from there to Strasbourg then? For well, this is the thing, I can't get to Strasbourg quick enough. enough. I can't get to <laughs> <laughs> The problem is the government plays the procedure. It all goes on, it yeah. spins off into infinity. Um, the, 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 it's a clear tactic. I don't know how Jeremy, whatever his name is, could say, or whoever it was, could say what he said. What they do is they get you out of the country and then they spin off the procedure to keep you out of the country. And that's a victory for them. That's a, that's a win. Because you're never going to get to the substance of your case. Yeah. And looking at three, four years at a least. lot of these cases yes. already. By which, by which time you serve for Strasbourg. In any right. case. <laughs> <laughs> totally. Thank you for that, Matthew. Yes. <laughs> Not to put too fine a point on it. Amanda, yeah. can I come back down to Earth a bit and ask about, I should know this, but about the impact of legal aid um, cuts on all of this? I mean, the residence test, does that apply to people in this situation? Not to SIAC. SIAC is ring fenced. Okay. But it would apply for, say, judicial review of a deprivation decision, say, if you wanted to argue that a deprivation decision was abusive or something, uh, by way of judicial review. At, at the moment, immigration is in on judicial review, apart from proceedings brought within a year of formal proceedings. So at the moment, judicial review is protected from immigration going out of scope. If the residence test comes in, yeah then judicial review is caught along with anything else and you will not get legal aid for judicial review if you are not lawfully resident and do not have 12 months prior lawful residence. So again, it's another effect of the order taking effect before your proceedings. Bingo, you're not lawfully resident just at the moment when it matters. Thanks for that. Thank you. Can I ask? Using my position here. Um, do you know of parallel developments happening say attacks where presumably there are similar categories of people that may very well be in Syria or elsewhere, where, I mean, France has used deprivation of nationality previously, but as to whether or not there may be some parallel development which you know, could in theory get to Strasbourg before you. That's true. I, I have to say that my, my knowledge of um, the, approach, the extent to which deprivation is being used in other countries is woefully. The only, um, the, the only impression I've got so far is that other countries are carefully watching the UK to see how it goes. Um, um, and that's been in some, uh, you know, I've seen various reports. There was a very interesting uh, report, I've forgotten who it's by, Andrew something or other. He, um, he was consulted on by the EU as to whether deprivation was an appropriate response to terrorism. And he came down, he was actually a previous head of the UKBA or head of the nationality section of the UKBA. So it's on the internet. Yeah. So, and Andrew you know, Wormsley. Yes, Andrew yeah. Wormsley. Yeah. He came very heavily down against it and he yeah. set up very cogent reasons why. Well. And so my understanding is that the EU position is that it's not a good plan. That's why I'm, I'm quite keen on getting you to, to um, certainly to the Court of uh, Justice, um, on, you know, on the Rotman point. Um, mm. Um, it's just getting it there, you know. I mean, Adrian go into a bit more detail. Thank sorry, you very I much. Sorry, I didn't help you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.